Well, it's really a pleasure. Thanks, Ashley. Um, I'm here with two of the leading public intellectuals, young public intellectuals yep. in the field. Um, they have written two wonderful books, The Art of Screen Time by Anya and The New Childhood uh, by Jordan Shapiro. Um, and I think that what we'll be talking about is this you know, kind of burgeoning digital media and learning movement and what, is, what does it have to do with parenting and educating our young ones today. So um, first question, who's your favorite Muppet and why? No, <laughs> uh, we'll get to that, we'll get to that later. We'll get to that later. Um, all right, so Anya, yeah. you have kind of taken on a really interesting perspective with Michael Pollan. You wanna say really quickly what your moniker is? Yeah, so um, so I set out to write The Art of Screen Time. My, my previous books are all about education, and then I had my own kids, and I was really um, struggling with the disconnect between how we talk about screens at home with families, which is mostly about guilt and shame and fear, um, versus the promises that were being made about kids and screens at school. And it was just such a wild disconnect that I knew that I had to try to square that circle somehow. And so after diving into the research and talking to like 500 parents um, with surveys and interviews, I came up with, I, I cribbed from Michael Pollan's food rules, uh, where he says, you know, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And I came up with the <laughs> slogan, enjoy screens, not too much, mostly together. And so I think that that's a brilliant moniker. Um, we're all sort of facing all these difficult um, kind of it used to be, you know, work family, you know, balance, and now so much of the dialogue, I think, is about the digital diet. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit about where the art of screen time comes out on this notion? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, first of all, we have to recall, right, that that we're in a first wave with these mobile devices, and um, they're in most of our memories before and after. And um, a couple things that might not be obvious about how they've changed, especially family life, it's not so much about time, right? Because we know that young children's dosage of technology and bleeping, blooping things has not gone up so much. But what has happened is that uh, the devices uh, have different affordances, and so there's different kinds of experiences around them. So number one is that um, they're so engaging for very young kids. Lo kids love the interaction, and that is something that infants adore, right? Um, and then uh, the second part is they tend to enclose each family member in their own experience. And that's something that the television didn't do, it's pretty new. And then the third thing I think that's often overlooked is that mobile devices come with us everywhere. Okay, you know that. But what's crazy is that we can now see and judge what other parents are doing. Um, yeah. And so one of the most, I think, um, brilliant but also evil studies that was done um, was by Jenny Radesky, brilliant researcher, where they went to a fast food restaurant and they watched the family groups at the fast food restaurant. And they found, you know, the parent that 80% of caregivers engrossed in their phones, making um, you know, statements in a robotic manner while pushing the kids' hands away from their from their phone, right? While the kids are pleading. And so this is really like imprinted on us and it connects with so many other things in the discourse around uh, feminism and our should be women be working and should they be with their children all the time and, and parenting and intensive parenting should we be paying attention to our kids all the time and so there's so much unex unexamined baggage that we're bringing to our judgments around the little triad or maybe now it's a quad with the kid device and parent and device yeah um, you spoke to about 500 people and admittedly it wasn't a representative national nope. survey um, but what surprised you about what you know the, the adults and children's lives had to say about technology and, and also explain to everybody that you do focus on young children but also on older kids too. Yeah, 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 of course. I mean, the, the art of screen time really takes in all of childhood and obviously, I mean, a huge amount of the conversations around teenagers right now, but I think early, early childhood is important. I have a two-year-old. So in uh, researching and talking with families, um, you know, they are very afraid and very confused. Um, the guilt and the shame becomes almost a reflexive um, uh, feeling that people mention, and then when you get talking with parents, they often almost times talking, they're talking about what other parents are doing. So they can't, it's very social, and they can't help themselves but judge and, and um, argue and complain and disagree, and I think that's because this is so unresolved, and we don't have any wise voice of reason that's coming in um, to tell us what's good and what's bad. And so what I'm really trying to do is, is getting parents to look at their own lives online as well, because I think social media is, you know, Dr. Google's the new Dr. Spock, and social media is the new back fence, and parents are coming together, sometimes in wonderful, empowering ways, and then you have the anti-vaxxers, 
right? So what happens when parents get together online? A whole lot of things. And some of them are great, and some of them are not so great. Yeah, well, more on Dr. Google later, perhaps. <laughs> um, Jordan, let's get you yes. into the mix. So, First, can I say, Anya, you are the wise voice. Oh. <laughs> well, she has already proven that, and now it's your turn to show us some of your sage advice. Um, so you've written a book called The New Childhood, um, Raising Kids to Thrive in a Connected World. And I know you a little bit, Jordan, because you're also a senior fellow at the John Gans Kinney Center. You're pretty provocative. Oh. <laughs> um, and you basically made the case that what we're doing now, especially in education and education reform, isn't really working, that kids are bored to tears, and there's something about the digital explosion that's not being well understood. Can you say a little bit about your main takeaways? Yeah, well, well in, in what you're talking about in education, I'll start with education, because uh, I, like, I, I talk about all of it, family, yeah. uh, the experience children are having, what it means to be a child in our, in our current time, which we often don't talk a lot about. We talk a lot about what we need to do for children, but not about what it feels like for children. Yeah. Um, um, but to, specifically to your question about education, you know, uh, part of what I, I say is I think we, we have this, this odd myth when we talk about school and education that there's such a thing as conventional, right? And this notion that what we do, what, you know, you hear this all the time, right? Oh, school hasn't changed in 100 years, which is just nonsense. It's changed so many ways. Anyone who's an educator here can tell you how many times they've had to change or how many times they've resisted changes, right? It's always constantly changing. Things are always constantly changing. And this idea that we're only in a new change um, uh, kind of drove me crazy. And that got me to start, uh, really, I wanted to describe what this means that we're moving into a new context and that we are always adapting to new contexts, right? It's not that, that, oh, we suddenly have something new we need to adapt to. It's that the job of parents, the job of teachers, the job of educators, the job of grown-ups has always historically been to go, how do I take old values and make them remain meaningful and relevant in new contexts? And for some reason, we're, we're at this like strange um, in the block where, where we where we feel where we feel like it's going to be harder this time than ever before, and I'm not really convinced. You know, if we could get over that block, I think that that, that most grown-ups, most parents, and most teachers actually know exactly how, how how to how to make a lot of the decisions if they could lose the fear a little bit. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that you argue that I found so interesting, and it seems like an obvious point, but we don't act as if we know what to do about it. It's so much of what goes on in education writ large is around a future that we can't even imagine. Yeah. I mean, we're trying to imagine it, we're trying to create all sorts of different pathways for learning. Can you say a little bit more about how yeah. that well, centered you? Yeah, well, you hear this all the time, and I, and I always go, wait, was there a time where people could imagine the future, <laughs> right? Like, 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 there's never been a time where you could imagine the future. You can imagine it. <laughs> right, you might be able to imagine it, but you never knew what was coming, right? There, there's so many things about my own childhood that were completely unimaginable to my grandparents, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I'm sure about my kids that they are completely unimaginable. And, and so, I, again, I, I was really sort of bothered by this narrative that we were at a unique time. Instead, I think we have so many models, so many historical models about how you manage, about how you manage change, about what matters even as context change. That being said, you still need to think a lot about what that context is. And what I, I what we often do, and this is this, this is one of the things that I did a ton of research about when, when writing this book, was what we often do is we, we start to imagine that those things that we once designed in order to adapt for previous technologies are the essential thing, right? So the, the one of the examples I talk about a lot in the book is the sandbox is a 20th century invention, right? Like it was developed in the 20th century. The way that we think of playgrounds was developed in the 20th century in order to deal with a changing economic and technological paradigm. And we're running around screaming, we need to preserve that at all costs. No, we need to preserve the things that that teaches at all costs. We need to preserve those values at all costs, but we may need to reimagine what those playgrounds look like in order to make it in order to make it even more relevant. Those values in a changing world. Yeah, yeah. So all of us here at you know ASU GSV, at least at some level, believe in the potential of digital media or digital yeah. technology to, if not transform lives, improve relationships and improve learning outcomes. Both of you sort of take a little bit of a, a view of this as, yes, maybe, but it, the potential is largely untapped, at least in some respects. Can you say a little bit about your perspective on what's been untapped, what's been tapped, and what needs to be sort of the next 
approach to using technology in, in new and interesting ways. So I've been covering the education technology space for a little over a decade. And in that time, I, you know, it's been through a hype cycle and I've been through a hype cycle. And yeah. um, I've seen a lot of different successes and failures. And I guess what fundamentally seems to me to be the things we always return to is that uh, doing, using digital education to unlock the promise of education is really, really hard, and it involves a great deal of faith in the autonomy of learners, and also in the strength of community. You need really strong communities, and you need not to be controlling what students are doing. And so when you look at Seymour Papert, or you look at the foundational geniuses. Who was Seymour Papert? Seymour Papert, the, um, from MIT, who created the first programming language for children, who backed the first. Logo. Um, one laptop per child programs um, in, in schools who really fundamentally believed. He was a developmental psychologist and an AI specialist. He did all of these things before anyone in this room did them. And he believed so fundamentally that children needed access to the intellectual tools that were represented by digital technology. They needed to be creators and to be participants in their own learning. And that is the one thing that we can never seem to get right because in schools, we're always trying to control what kids are doing. And we're always trying to control the outcomes and measure the outcomes. And so when you're doing that, you're really working at cross purposes with the, with the fundamental idea, the, the potential that I find so interesting, which is this Montessori 2.0. Or it's not even actually Montessori. Montessori is more planned and organized than the image that something, someone like Papert had about how children could learn through immersion in the world of, of technology. And so Ganya and Jordan both are, I call them scholarly journalists. I mean, they've done a ton of research in addition to their reporting in these books. And I mean, dig into like a couple of studies, you guys, that kind of show off the modern day, you know, paper. Like you, you, you talked about um, how to get a start on this in your book. Like what would be the habits of mind that you would expect to see among the adults and children's lives right from the start that would allow them to deploy? technologies in a more useful way. And you can praise, test me if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, I talk about it from a parenting perspective. I talk about um, Diana, Diana Bomeran's um, structure of warmth versus structure in parenting, that parents can be, you know, they can be highly over, um, overstructured and harsh, that demanding, authoritarian. They can be totally checked out, permissive. They can be Sorry, they can be warm, but but not structured. That's permissive. They can be totally checked out. That's neglectful. Or you can be high on the dimensions of warmth and structure. And that's kind of the emotional temperature that you want to be around um, when you're parenting and also just you know caregiving or teaching young children. You need to be encouraging, but also have some ideas of routines. And um, you know, I think that uh, you know, listening to kids, being curious um, about them and celebrating them and and understanding that they take their lives very seriously. Is something I think that. And where does tech come in? Really where does well. te oh, okay, so yeah. that's where tech sort of comes in in an well, interesting way. Yeah, I mean, I think the way technology like and digital media can come in together is, um, you know, it has been a radically inclusive vision. Something like Sesame has come in to say that, you know, parents are different and families are different, but there are some things that we can provide to everyone and that children can kind of encounter on their own. And that really is. That's the huge bet that something like Sesame made, that they, the case that they proved in television and the case that we're trying to prove today. Yeah, but not yet in digital. Um, can, not to I, the same I, extent. Can I, so, can I yeah, add Jordan. To that? I, yeah. Mean, I, I think that's a, that, that's a great point. And if you look at what, what, what Sesame did, right, that was still the television at the, at the beginning, and it, was, and it was very passive. And we have so much research talking about the importance of play We have so, that, that people tend to think of as separate from, from, from digital. But I think that digital, I think games, I think interactive platforms, I think tablets have the potential to, 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 to minimize that play gap, right? That gap to, to distribute more play to more to more kids, to create more equitable play that, that that's actually designed in ways that allow kids to take uh, control of their of their of their own learning and their own ability to experiment, and it's not just that I think that in terms of that that has the potential to distribute and create access. If we're moving into a world, I, and I'm and I'm pretty sure we are. Maybe you got someone can argue with me, but I'm pretty sure we're moving into a world where screens are ubiquitous. I'm yeah. pretty sure that. I mean, I'm, wait, let's see how many screens do I see right now? Just looking around, like yeah. like, like I, I haven't done I haven't tracked my own time or anything, but I'm pretty sure 
sure that 70% of my interactions, professional, romantic, personal, happen through, mediated through a screen at this point. So our kids are moving into a world that looks like that, and we want to make sure that they do that in the most ethical way, in the kindest way, in, 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 the, in the happiest way, in the most fulfilled way. They need the practice playing with those tools in order to be able to do it. We already know this. We know that the more you let kids play with pencils, the better they're going to get at writing, right? We know yeah. the more that you yeah. let them play with, with smartphones, the better they're going to get at smartphones. Of course, you have to curate that play. I don't mean just like hand it to kids and leave them by themselves. Uh, uh, and so much of what I write about is how parents can guide their kids through that play so that that becomes uh, uh, they learn the positive lessons about how to live a holistic life in which tech is integrated rather than the life we are current, which I, I call it the, we're, we're all currently living the, the binge and purge digital detox mindset, <laughs> right? Where we, where we all just stare at it for a while and then feel guilt, stare at it for a while and then feel guilt. And, and I don't want my kids to do that. I want my kids to actually know how to read, read a text message and not feel bad about it and put it down and focus on what they're doing. I want them to know when that's a positive time, when that's it's not a positive time. I don't see any way to teach my own children that by going, hey, you've got two hours a day where you're allowed to use screens by yourself in your room, mm -hmm. right? How are they ever going to learn that? The only way they're going to learn to do that is if I sit with them and start to get them to practice playing. That playing is just practice. It's just good practice for being a grown-up, right? With, yeah. without, 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 without high stakes. <laughs> so I read both books hoping and praying that there was some level of disagreement. And on page 117 or something, Jordan takes one little one-sentence shot at Anya in which he says, I'm wary of a perspective that sees, referring to the digital you know, balanced diet metaphor, <laughs> I'm wary of a perspective that sees digital devices as a temptation and imagines that parents are responsible for managing their kids' ability to exercise restraint. You sort of uh, referred to this just a moment ago. Yeah. Can you explain? Yeah, yeah, you found the one sentence. Wow, and that's after I cut all the other bad ones, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, just kidding. You should um, hear what Anya said about your book. <laughs> um, no, no, I, I mean, look, look. Of course, you can only find one because I, I, I really, there's, there's, there's nothing I have to complain about in, in what Anya's uh, written. But, but I think we're talking about very different things. A, a, Anya, the scope of Anya's book is very much about how parents manage today, and, and, and I'm uh, sort of imagining the future and. Uh, Imagining that as long as we still maintain this idea of screen time versus non-screen time, that that's a problem. So I am very wary that that becomes the norm. That's yeah. certainly the yeah. way to consider it yeah. right now in yeah. this current moment of time. But in the long run, if parents continue to think of screen time versus non-screen time rather than a life integrated with digital technologies, sometimes screens, sometimes not screens, but AI is a digital technology, like it's already integrated into our lives. We can either be aware of it and do that in a smart way, or we cannot. Um, and, and there's a lot of dangers. I mean, I hate to say this, but I feel like it, we're very much on the same page. But we also break down on very traditional gender mm -hmm. guidelines. Oh, guides, because you are literally the dad on the couch playing video games with your <laughs> sons. That's right. And I am literally the mom being like, "Hmm, what should our rules be? Let me make a chart." You know? and, like, and, and dads are like culturally set up to play with their kids. They they roughhouse yeah. with them. They introduce risk. They say, hey, what's the big deal? Let's see. It's fun. And moms are totally placed in this yeah. role, whether like the instructors and the moral teachers and the keepers of the home. And so it's just it's just patriarchy. Yeah. Maybe yeah. shake out in this way. That's right. But, but they're both really, really necessary. And they're both really important. And I think we both completely agree that it cannot just be parents. First of all, it's not just parents' job. It's society's job. It's educators' job. And it's not just parents' job to say no. It's right. parents' job to figure out how am I going to say yes? How am I yeah. going to encourage? And I'm looking for more ways to enjoy digital time alongside my kids because I know that that's the path to really um, help them, like, like you said, play and rehearse and grow into the roles that they're going to have. And I'll, I'll tell you a triumphant story <laughs> if I'm Go ahead, to. yeah. Well, well, before you do, I yeah. just want to point out this male-female dichotomy. Yeah. Take a look at the imagery <laughs> on Jordan's oh, book God. versus the imagery. Oh. I'm, just, I'm just saying, I'm not psychoanalyzing you guys, but please continue. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't right. expect that. No, I did not expect that from Michael. <laughs> I'm very, very surprised. Um, no, but I was just going to say that, so the other day my daughter came home and she said, I heard that there's a bad 
lady on YouTube and she tells you to kill yourself or she'll kill your family. And this is what I heard on the playground. And I said, this is Momo, right, the digital boogeyman. And yeah. I was like, well, yeah. uh, did the kids that told you, do they actually see it? She was like, no. And I was like, do you, how could Momo know where you live? It's just a video. She's not talking to you. She was like, yeah. I was like, how could you ask a question next time if somebody tells you something like that, that you will figure it out and you won't worry about it? And she was like, yeah, I could ask them if they actually saw it themselves. Yeah. yeah. You know? that's and so that's compelling. the like, you know, that there is scary stuff out there and we also can equip our kids to, to meet it. All right. In a minute, we're gonna ask you to, you know, a couple of questions from you all. Um, so get ready. Um, you now have a shot to ask each other a question. So oh. when you're reading each other's book, okay. <laughs> what did you want to ask Jordan? Well, I mean, I, d I did interview him on NPR.org. <laughs> it was a great interview and people loved it. What did um, you ask him that we should all know about? Well, I think that the thing I would have asked you, I mean, I heard, I, I love the historical analogies that you use and it is always really wonderful to think about Plato and Young in the context of, you know, Fortnite and video yeah. games. But I do sometimes wonder that- <laughs> Which you, he does. Yeah, which he does, which you should read the book to find out about. I do worry because I really try to be cognizant of the fact that there are some kids that are not okay. Yeah. And with a sanguine message that parents will be wanting to hear, you know, is there any chance at all that of the kids that are not okay, some of them will, you know, right. how, do you live, how do you acknowledge that fact? Yeah, and of course I get this question, this question all the time about the about the kids who, because there are absolutely people who develop unhealthy relationships, and there's a lot of with with, de, with devices or video games, and there's a lot of kids right now that that's that that's happening. And Anya to, digs into the research on yeah, that, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you know, uh, uh, this. You know, people develop unhealthy relationships to lots of things. We develop unhealthy relationships to sex and to money and to food and to work, and we can do all of those things. And in none of those cases do we decide that food and money and sex and work are, are, the, are the evil, right? Instead, we acknowledge that there's probably some other issue that has led to that, um, and, 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 the, and that that issue needs to be addressed. Um, so absolutely, um, when, when those relationships develop, they need to be addressed. Parents need to intervene. Parents may need to send their kids to whatever, you know, the fancy new rehabs, for all I know, depending yeah. on, on, the, on, on, the, on how serious that is. But we also need to remember that that, that, that that is only addressing the symptom and that what the kids really need is your support and your love as they find out what the deeper problem is. Otherwise, they'll just find something else to, to, yeah. to, to deal with that with. And I get really scared when I hear all the scapegoating of the of the of Fortnite, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm you know, and I'm not saying I think Fortnite is great, but I'm going if we start blaming society's problems on Fortnite, we're going to miss the real problems, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and well, and there that's... are real things we need to, we need to address, and we may need to stop a little bit of Fortnite for some kids, but that's not the same as addressing the thing that is causing them to to, to be escaping yeah. into that yeah. into that world. Besides yeah. that one sentence slam, do you have anything else you want to ask Anya? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't think so. I don't think so. Anya's book is full full of, of so many well well researched. You know, I mean, there's I, I keep it by my desk because uh, I have so many inter interviews where I have to be able to answer questions about research, <laughs> and there, there's not there's not a better yeah. version yeah. That, that completely summarizes all the research around screen time, all the current all the current research, and and so uh, and does it fairly, right? I mean, there's tons of people who have written books that do it in a in a, in a way where they just pick. Uh, cherry pick the ones yeah. that prove their their bias, but 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 Anya, Anya doesn't do that. So um, right. so I don't. I have, tried I, to divide them, but didn't work. Yeah, it do we have a couple? Of, do we have, hard. Do we have a couple of questions? <laughs> anyway, yeah. yeah. Uh, I spent most of my Say who you are. Uh, Brian Kitty, I'm the CEO of Newtons. Great. I spent most of my time in my life in higher education. I have four kids, nine through nineteen. Yeah. In all your research, all the blogging, your books. What surprised you the most? Yeah, I was going to ask years. that. That's a great question. Um, I think the biggest thing that I like stumbled over in the beginning of looking at the research was the connection between screens and sleep. Mm -hmm. And you're going to say, duh. <laughs> but the fact is that the sleep researchers have all the goods on how technology, technology impacts sleep, which in turn impacts all the other things we're worried about, mood, behavior, weight, depression. Um, consolidation of memories and early learning. 
And so screens, and they do it, it does it through a really simple mechanism. So whenever anyone says, oh, all screen time is not the same, in most cases that's true. But when you're talking about a tiny device that shines a blue light into your face from 10 inches away, yeah, all screen time is the same. And then the cortisol that's produced when you're engaging with exciting content or just interesting stuff or something your friend posted, that's all the same too. It's a very primitive kind of interaction. And so I really feel like the sleep researchers have a, um, it's so easy to overlook, we are a very underslept culture, but especially for little kids, because they, their sleep patterns are changing all the time, and I think if they can show that na naps are fading out earlier, as kids that are more rambunctious are given screens to supposedly calm them down, but actually it's stimulating them, um, that that could have a real serious knock-on effect for school readiness and other things. And then obviously teenagers, it's all the bad stuff. I mean, kids that don't sleep are the kids, there's a lot of things that say like, what you could think of as a teenager is actually just somebody who hasn't slept. <laughs> it's like, oh, they're bored, they have a lack of focus, they're Familiar surly, that they're unkempt. Like, it, they're just, they just, they're a person who hasn't slept. All right, another question? Oh, back in the back, sorry. Say, say who you are. No, thanks for that question, Lila. And actually, I wanted to add, I mean, yeah. so much of your research, informal research in this respect, it was diverse, but not maybe as diverse it in could, terms of <laughs> low-income families. Yeah, it could definitely be more diverse. So, yeah. so um, number of things. So Lynn Schofield Clark did a great book a few years ago where she it was a qualitative study of families at different socioeconomic levels. And what she documented, interestingly, was a positive pattern among the working class families in that they shared their screen time more often. Um, and they talked about it more. So even though they weren't making the high-end choices as far as content, it was overall more positive because they were more likely to discuss the shows that they were watching and the things that they were doing. Um, we now are in a situation where the smartphone divide has gone away. 98% of all families with young children have at least one digital device in the home. I mean, I don't want to say flip it, that it has all gone away. There is still a, a divide in terms of type of device. But in terms of screen time, um, there's not really a divide. And so what we're now concerned about is what settings are children in, mm -hmm. what kind of supervision are they getting, is there interest in, um, in trying to influence parents to help kids make quote unquote better choices. And uh, that's a huge task I think in front yeah. of Sesame and a lot of other organizations. Which Jordan, you want to comment about. on equity concerns? I mean, I would, what, I would, what would I do, there's not a lot yet that I'd like to see and I think you're getting to that it's gonna come, which is, which is really a lot about how the devices are being used on, on a really granular level, right? Like we've yeah. done a lot in terms of going, you know, who's using it for just video and who's using it for games. But, but I'm sort of interested what kind of games, how the different yeah. kinds of experiences happen. Um, because I, I think then, because again, almost everything in my perspective assumes that, that digital is our new context, right? Yeah. Not, not, uh, not one thing. Right, so therefore, I want to know how that context is is different. It's going to end up playing in the same kind of questions as questions about how vocabulary is built, what kind of vocabulary gets used in different kinds of digital media, and I think we really need to get down to that because uh, uh, otherwise, we'll just end up, end up replicating all of the same things yeah. in, in a brand new context. And Okay. Well, I just want to mention really quickly, I think a fascinating area is English language learners and yeah. the different ways that they use technology and the role reversal that can take place sometimes where children or young people in a family are the translators, but they also might be the digital concierge. And mm -hmm. so is there, is there a potential for learning and for kind of celebrating and upholding those interactions where the kid is the digital ambassador of the family? Yeah. And shameless plug, uh, Layla and others, for the Jung and Cooney Center's research, which has dug into the different ways in which um, low-income and diverse families experience media, which is often different than some of the profiles that you see of uh, the more uh, wealthy um, <laughs> kids. Um, all right, we're coming to a wrap. Okay. I wanted to ask you two quick final questions. Okay. You guys have been appointed as members of the transition team for the new president in 2020. Who is it? I can't tell you. <laughs> I, know, I know who it is, but I can't tell you. Um, and you have been asked to design the priorities for a $250 million digital media and learning fund, which is going to focus because Chris Perry is now you know, working in the White House on um, early learning. 
and how to untap the potential of you know, digital media for early learning? Where do we start? Uh, I, I, think, I think I would uh, in, encourage us to ask questions about less, you know, I, I think the, the instinct people usually go to is the question about how to use the media or the digital in order to distribute uh, learning, right? And I, and I would much rather see us ask questions about how do we make sure we're preparing children uh, with, the, with the kinds of thinking and the kinds of experiences that will allow them to be, uh, um, well, I was going to say autonomous, but also good citizens uh, uh, in, a world, in a world where everything will be mediated through a device, right? How do we make sure they, they're, 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 that, that, that their mind has shifted in such a way they have the right habits of mind to be able to take these tools and leverage them in order to make the world they want to see and hopefully the world we want to see too because I've always been the, the don't prepare your kids for the world, prepare the world for your kids yeah. mindset. Yeah. yeah, 250, a quarter of a billion bucks, Anya. <laughs> um, I would take, I would get diverse parents and teachers and put them on teams with technologists and designers to create and imagine amazing learning experiences and to learn together um, so that they could also get training in stimulating those kinds of experiences um, with their kids and for their kids. Okay, final question. One must do and one watch out as you think about the work that you have just completed in terms of the audience here, activating them over the next year. Must do, watch out. Jordan. Hmm. It's a hard one. Uh, uh, one must Send it do. to you in advance. I, I know, but I assumed it would run out of time before they got to the last question. <laughs> one, one must do, watch out. Um, you can just give me one or the other. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, look, I, 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 it's going to be a, a similar variation on what I said for the last answer, which is, and, and they're going to go together as a must do, watch out, right? Okay. Watch out, must do, to watch out, which is we have so many things that the, the, you know, there are so many dangerous challenges of the, of the, of the, of the world we're entering into. There, you know, whether we're talking about the bias with AI that mm -hmm. could be programmed into it, whether we're talking about surveillance and privacy issues, right? There's so many dangerous things. And the only way that, that there's gonna be a democratic solution to making sure democracy is preserved in that tech world is to make sure that an entire generation of kids is, is raised with the technological literacy yeah. to make informed decisions, thoughts, and take informed actions about how to respond to those dangers. Because I would say most adults are running around yeah. going, hey, I've heard there's a surveillance issue, but I don't know which way to vote All on right. it. Great. <laughs> on your last word. I mean, I would say that you can create amazing content and experiences for kids, but if you don't get the business model right, your incentives are going to be misaligned and you're going to end up exploiting the heck out of the people that you um, reach, who we sometimes call users, which is a terrible way to speak about children. Wonderful. Could you please join me in thanking Anya and Jordan for a terrific conversation? <laughs>